In thinking about uh, how to construct this speech, I thought about my two young boys who happen to be here at the moment, and I thought about what it was that I would tell them uh, when they're old enough to understand why it is that a parliament of the 21st century, armed with the knowledge that we have, knowing what we know about the science of climate change, knowing what we know about what it means for our environment, the Great Barrier Reef, the loss of a great many species, the melting of the ice sheets in the Antarctic, what it means for their health with an increased frequency of extreme weather, droughts, floods, bushfires, knowing that the world that they inherit will be a very different world to the world we currently live in, and why it is today that when we had the opportunity to take action, we did what no other country, no other country around the world has done, and that we retreated. We retreated when the time came to get on the front foot and tackle this challenge head on. How do I explain that to my two boys? How is it that, armed with the knowledge we have, that we could have taken this sort of action? And I think it's important that we go back a little to look at how it is that we got here. Climate change is an issue that we've known about for decades. For decades. In fact, it was first put on the map by the Conservative Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher, who recognised just what sort of challenge it presented to future generations. It's an issue that we've accumulated a growing body of knowledge around. It's a, an issue where the mainstream scientific consensus is all heading in one direction. Now, people have a view about science, that science is about these eureka moments where we stumble upon an answer uh, to a problem that we have uh, up until that point been unable to solve. Well, that's not how most science develops. It's a continual process of trial and error. It's researching a hypothesis. It's putting out that information to your peers in the scientific communi community, having them critique that information. It's an iterative process, and we emerge with what is a scientific consensus on the back of that process. And the scientific consensus at the moment is very, very clear. We have an alarming problem. We need to act, and we need to act quickly if we're going to be able to halt some of the most extreme consequences of climate change. Now, on the back of that knowledge, on the back of that increasing awareness from politicians from across the political spectrum, and we need to recognise that it, this is a uniquely Australian problem, that this is being seen through the prism of partisan politics, when in fact right around the world it's not a left-right issue. It's an issue of knowledge versus those people who refuse to accept the scientific wisdom of the time. That's what this issue was about. And my children will want to know, how is it that at a time when that knowledge was so strong that this parliament refused to act? Well, if we go back to the start of the last decade, what we saw was a growing momentum here in Australia for change. We were coming off the back of one of the worst droughts in our history. There was growing awareness around the world. Al Gore came to town and presented his documentary, An Inconvenient Truth. We saw marches on the streets. We saw young people become engaged. And we saw both sides of politics take to an election a proposal for an emissions trading scheme. That is to price pollution, to put a price on an activity that we're all paying for 
and using classic market principles, saying, well, if you are going to produce a good or service and that cost of producing that good or service is borne by the taxpayer, then we should make sure that we internalise internalize that cost so that you're responsible for that pollution and that there is an incentive to reduce it. Pretty basic principle in mainstream economics. So both the Howard and Rudd opposition at the time, the Howard government and Rudd opposition, took that proposal to the Australian people. Then what we saw over the period of the next few years was a dismantling of that bipartisan consensus. And that's what's led us to where we are today. What we saw was a, a conservative opposition become dominated by those anti-science, anti-enlightenment individuals prepared to mount an ideological crusade in the face of all the mounting evidence in front of them. We saw a prime minister whose pragmatism or an opposition leader whose pragmatism knew, knew, knew no bounds, a self-confessed weather vane when it came to climate change, gain control of the opposition on the back of opposing concrete action on climate change. What we then saw was a prime minister who up until that point had recognised that this was the great global challenge of our era, what he described as a moral challenge, quite rightly, who had negotiated an emissions trading scheme with the opposition, then walk away from that commitment and refusing to negotiate on that scheme with the Greens. We effectively, on the back of that decision, dismantled the bipartisan consensus that existed here and in many other countries uh, across the world. What we saw from that point on was the politicisation of, of an issue that is beyond politics. We saw a government promise a citizens' assembly on an issue that required government leadership. We saw a, we saw a prime minister and an opposition leader refused to stand up to the growing challenge that faces us. On the back of that election, we saw new voices elected to both houses of parliament. And we finally got going with action on climate change. We saw the establishment of the Climate Change Committee that came up with some of the world's most ambitious and important action to tackle climate change. We saw a fixed price on carbon moving to an ETS, which if this parliament accepted, we would now have an emissions trading scheme in a short period of time tied in with international carbon markets. We saw the establishment of a renewable energy bank, the Clean Energy Finance Corporation, a bank that provides upfront investment for those industries that are the, that are the industries of the future. And we're seeing right across the country the wind industry, the solar industry and other new emerging renewable industries take advantage of that and provide the added benefit of ensuring a return for this country. We saw the establishment of the Climate Change Authority and Climate Change Commission, effectively a reserve bank providing independent advice on targets, on the most up-to-date science and ensuring that governments were provided with that information outside of the partisan nature of this debate. All important, necessary things, but underpinned by the very notion that we have a price on pollution. Unfortunately, what we have now seen is a new parliament and a new Senate 
who are prepared to undo some of those great reforms. How is it that we go from having some of the world's most significant, most ambitious climate change legislation to being the only country anywhere in the world to wind back effective action on climate change in the face of growing evidence of how serious this problem is. Well, if you look at the example of the tobacco industry and how it took decades for us to finally confront the reality that tobacco was a cause of lung cancer, you can see some parallels in the climate change debate. The use of these fringe scientists held up people like Bob Carter as evidence that somehow the scientific consensus is wrong. The role of the mainstream press, who when presented with a scientific argument, feel the need to present a counter-argument. That's not balance, that's false balance. The role of the press is to get to the truth, not to present two sides of an argument as though each side has equal legitimacy. It's truth that we're after, not some notion of false balance. And that's where we've arrived at with the climate change debate. And of course, we saw the role of politics, front and centre. Back in the tobacco days, it was the conservative side of politics as saw this as some part of a global conspiracy to control people's freedoms and behaviours, that the link between lung cancer and tobacco was a myth, and that those of us on the progressive side of politics were using it as a vehicle to restrict people's freedoms. That was the argument that was being trotted out 50 years ago. It was trotted out 50 years after the Surgeon General conclusively stated tobacco causes lung cancer. And yet we had those same elements, those same conservative forces, implying that this was some, a part of some progressive crusade to restrict people's freedoms. And we're seeing it play out again. We're seeing it play out with the climate change debate that in the face of science, in the face of reason, in the face of logic, that somehow this is all part of some global conspiracy. We're all in it together. The scientific community, the health community, economists, and of course those of us on this side of politics. We've entered into some sort of grand bargain because we can think of nothing other than to restrict people's freedoms and liberties. What nonsense! What poppycock! Where have we come to when in an environment where all we've got, the best tool we have, and that is science, is being subjugated to a narrow, brutal, conservative ideological agenda? And in the years to come, my children will look at this and they'll look at what this parliament done and they will see those parallels between the climate change debate, the deniers and those people who stood up and took a stand when we needed to take a stand. Order. Senator Di Natale, please resume your seat. Madam. You have already been warned by the President of the Senate that interjecting is disorderly. I will now have to invite you to remove yourself from the gallery. Senator Di Natale. And of course, what will be told is that we have a government that has a mandate to implement this change. Well, let me tell you what mandate this government has. It has a mandate to govern. It has a mandate to prosecute its arguments. It has an, a mandate to negotiate with the parliament. 
It does not have a mandate to railroad legislation through this parliament without any opposition. And only yesterday we heard Senator Macdonald say and in fact compare the issue of climate change to 1930s Germany. Well, let me tell you what totalitarianism is. Totalitarianism is expecting that just because you've won an election, there should be no opposition, there should be no Senate, that we should acquiesce to the policies of the government of the day. No, that is not democracy. Democracy is saying you have a mandate to govern, and those millions of people who voted for the Greens, who voted for Labor, who voted for independence, also have a mandate to prosecute their arguments, to put their arguments forward, and to ensure that we make sure that this parliament remains a democracy. Where was respect for the Labor Party's mandate in 2007 when it promised to introduce an ETS? Where was Tony Abbott, the Prime Minister's respect for that mandate when that was taken to the 2007 election? Where is the respect for the mandate of this place, the Senate, also democratically elected, and people who come to vote in the Senate do so intentionally, knowing that they are voting for a hand on the shoulder of the executive of the day? And so we will continue to fight until this legislation makes its way through the parliament. We'll continue to ensure that it is my kids and the kids right around the country whose actions today, or whose, we're, we're to, the parliament of today, will be determining their futures. We'll be making decisions that don't affect us, as Senator Cameron said yesterday. He's not a young man anymore. Well, you said it. <laughs> and it's, but it's his kids and grandkids who will inherit the decisions of this parliament. And they will be asking a question. They will say, when the time came to make a stand, when you had the knowledge, when all of the science was pointing in one direction, why did you vote against that knowledge? What was it that brought you to a decision that, that meant that you believed you had some sort of divine understanding about a problem that requires scientific understanding, expertise? How is it that you were arrogant enough to believe the 10 minutes on the internet equipped you with the knowledge to make a decision that would affect us, our futures and the future of this planet. Well, I'll tell you something. We will be making it very clear that when the time came to take a stand, not to retreat, but to take a step forward, we did everything we can to do that. And that's why we're here. Now, that's why the Greens have been consistent in our position from day one, that we need to act. We need to act with conviction. We need to ensure that we implement a price on carbon, support for renewables and take action globally and lead the world in what is the great moral challenge of our century. And uh, I want to be able to look at my kids and say I did that. And um, all of you will have to do the same. Thank you.